Thank you, Carol. Um, if you could have a seat at the table, um, we will have a discussion moderated by Shanita Hughes Howard of the Medical University of South Carolina with discussants Levi Garraway at Harvard and Kelly Orman at um, Stanford University. So thank you. I'd like to um, first thank all the presenters for uh, great presentations. And perhaps we can start with some opening comments by our two discussants. So I thought those were all great talks highlighting a number of both uh, challenges and also some very interesting suggestions for how to address them. So I think certainly the, 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 um, the need and the challenge, it was very well articulated, the, the prevalence of disparities uh, in, in, uh, in health, but particularly the potential for that to be paradoxically worsened uh, by genetic medicine. Uh, th there are a few examples given. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, several of them were in uh, newborn screening, cancer, of course, are being out ahead. But, but there are a variety of, of areas, though, where um, there, there, there are these disparities, and one could easily imagine uh, ways in which uh, things could get further confounded and worsened if we're not highly attentive. Um, at the same time, I thought this uh, was quite an encouraging overall uh, set of information because one can begin to envision a framework where that doesn't happen, or at least where um, we use tools that have now matured in implementation science, in comparative effectiveness research, and in uh, public health, for example, where we can, where as we go, we can in principle, implement uh, approaches to learn and to and, and not just to learn where the problems are, but to, to actually study how um, the advances that we're making might close those gaps in a hypothesis-driven way. And, and what I heard anyway, and I'm sure we'll have a conversation on this, is that uh, the, the, the themes over and over again that we hear around barriers some of them uh, are, one can imagine, are, are quite addressable. So one of the themes that we heard is, of course, the issue of, um, of challenges around uh, recruitment, uh, challenges around uh, understanding uh, on the part of clinicians, particularly clinicians that are taking care of patients in diverse and underserved areas, even what genomic medicine is and how do you use the information. There are challenges around how do you um, how do you leverage, for example, the electric electronic health records, the environments that clinicians work in all the time? How do you work within that to kind of feed information that could be used to make decisions? Uh, and then, of course, how do you study whether those outcomes are, are, are or whether those decision the decision making is is influencing outcomes in, in a meaningful way? The, but the good news is that for each of those, there are already activities, uh, in, many, in many cases in Ignite, but certainly around the country, where one can start to imagine, uh, if not best practices, at least hypotheses of, of, of packaged interventions that might make a difference. And, and one, of the, one of the points that I think Carol made towards the end of her talk of, of identifying areas of low-hanging fruit. Uh, and, and starting there, uh, and, and it may be a, a, so because success can sort of breed success. So, and all of us in in our in fields that we're in can probably identify what some of those areas are. Certainly in cancer, which is where I'm in, it's it's very clear that, uh, and we heard some of this that the use of genetic testing, whether it's for germline screening or for mutational profiling, for known standard of care interventions lags in diverse and underserved populations. So they're less likely to get tested, and, and if tested, they're less likely to actually uh, be acted upon. They're less likely to have access to targeted therapies that we know work. So, you know, variants of uncertain significance, I mean, it's great, it's, it's an important area, and certainly there should be efforts, I agree with the, the point that Rick made about efforts to, to link uh, databases of variants in diverse populations so we don't misclassify and end up calling a variant something when it's really in a, in a particular population, it's really not. That's obviously very important. Uh, but, but equally, one can identify interventions that we know work and where there are clear uh, disparities. And, and so there, one, could, one can begin to do hypothesis-driven research to say, for example, you know, we hypothesize that you know, uh, partnerships between uh, leading academic centers and, and community centers 
that can allow uh, infrastructure implementations uh, to, to disseminate this information, or we will build educational modules or, or build streams that can go into EHR, and we're going to test whether or not that information, you know, having that information uh, actually leads to d differential utilization and therefore differential outcomes. I mean, one can begin to conceive of and, and articulate what those kinds of studies would look like, and that can be done uh, even in the uh, standard of care, we know what the variants are, we know what we would do with them, and, but we know that there are gaps. And, and, uh, and I think Ignite certainly is well positioned because that's sort of where you guys are. You're, you're already at the point of focusing on variants where there's already a reasonable amount of utility data. The question is how do you, how do you broaden that and how do you uh, determine whether when broadening, broadening it, you've actually uh, improved health outcomes. So, uh, that's maybe my opening salvo. I, I was actually I was heartened because in listening to this, you know the, the uh, you know the scientists. You, you know usually when you're reading a proposal, you're you're when you're reading a proposal, you're you're kind of you're you're looking for well, what's the experiment I would do, what's the study I would do uh, to test uh, the uh, to test whether or not this will work. And in hearing these discussions, you could already your brain could already race ahead. Well, these are very simple, straightforward. Uh, I mean, not simple logistically, but conceptually. There are m multiple opportunities where we know there are gaps, where we could easily implement some of these approaches, and the chances are there would be successes, and success can breed success in terms of uh, galvanizing broader interest and engagement. So I'll, I'll stop there. <clears throat> Great. Goes back here. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit from a perspective of having been back in the clinic for the past year and some of the challenges that I think I've experienced that are reflected in the things I've heard from this group. And I want to start by saying, first of all, that I think Ignite has, as Carol said, done a really nice job at trying to engage these diverse communities from the start. And I'll invite you to target California next because we can cover the Latino and Asian populations that you're missing from your diversity map. Um, one of the things that I've seen a little bit is how important the access and the coverage are to truly being able to integrate genomic medicine. And um, in our pediatric setting at the hospital, we offer exomes to all of our pediatric patients where we think it might make a difference. And that population is probably about 50% Latino and more than 50% on Medi-Cal. And Medi-Cal is just not covering most of these exomes, so our hospital will have to choose whether or not they're going to cover those and then make decisions at that point. And then out of those that go for insurance authorizations, only about 50% of those are being covered. So I think that coverage is really clearly going to be one of our huge barriers. And if we're going to see any sort of access for diverse populations, that's going to be one thing that needs to be tackled. And I was just really thrilled to hear Tony present on the payer engagement, because I think that that's got to be a national engagement in order for it to go anywhere. So that's the first thing I'll say. I think the second thing that's become really obvious is how hard it's going to be to actually get all of these different clinician groups to understand enough about genomics to triage the right people and to get them where they need to go and to make sure that whether through EHR or otherwise, people can actually find the genomic results that they're looking for. Something as simple as the fact that most of these results are scanned in PDFs that show up on the media tab that you can't see on Care Everywhere and Epic can really influence how much this actually matters. And that seems like a really simple, stupid thing, but I can't tell you how many patients that's meant like, I don't know what's going on with you, so the fact that you had an exome you know, it's sort of worthless medically. Um, so that's one thing that I wanted to say. The other thing I want to talk about is something that Carol talked about around the diversity of our genomics workforce. So we've been wrestling with this forever. Um, as a genetic counselor, our numbers really haven't changed very much. We still hover around 90% Caucasian and 90% women and only about 10% with any ethnic diversity. And in the most recent professional status survey, only about 12% report fluently speaking some language other than English. And that is a huge problem. It's probably worse if you look at people in clinical genomics on the MD and PhD front. And I think you're exactly right, that we need to engage a diverse workforce and a linguistically diverse workforce. Um, we try really hard in California to train at least a couple people every year to go out and be fluent in Spanish or Mandarin or other languages. And I feel like it's complicated enough to explain these issues to patients in English. To try to do it in a language that isn't theirs 
makes it even harder, and that's going to impact our uptake. So if we want to make this actually happen in diverse populations, we really need to work on our linguistic things. Um, and we need to have that health literacy taken into account and the numeracy. And I think we also actually need to not reinvent the wheel there, because there's been a lot of work done in that area. Um, you know, I was just thinking that Isaac Lipkus did a grant probably almost 10 years ago now where he actually worked on risk communication in diverse populations around genetics. So we need to start with what's there and then kind of see what we need and operationalize it into actual resources that can be handed out. Um, and then the final thing that I want to say is I feel like there's a lot more space for psychosocial work around how diverse communities approach things like healthy genomes and the predictive ability that we may have here. Um, whether or not people are going to think about family cascade testing in similar or different ways and how well accepted that will be because as, as Muin was saying, if you don't get people out there passing the information along, then you get papers that say maybe we shouldn't be doing this testing in the first place. So we need to see how that's going to work on a diverse level as well. So I'll stop there. Thank you. I'd now like to open it up to um, the audience for your questions, comments, reactions. Yes. Uh, Mark Williams Geisinger. So this is directed to Muin. And he'll not be surprised at what he's going to hear because he's heard it from me any number of times. Um, I think uh, the, the public health perspective is critically important, but I think we also need to distinguish between public health and the public's health. Uh, because in many ways, I think uh, programs like um, Lynch syndrome screening and um, HBOC surveillance and familial hypercholesterolemia, uh, while clearly public health problems, um, are not necessarily well served by a traditional public health infrastructure in the sense that the resources that are needed, like mammograms and colonoscopies and that, are not within the control of the public health sector. And the other problem is that the public health sector, um, the pie, is not growing. Um, and certainly in relative terms, it's shrinking. And so if you really try and force this into traditional public health delivery, you really have to ask the question, well, what are we going to give up? It's going to be something in food safety, water safety, you know, those types of things. And so the, to me, the critical question is how do we um, move this into, I use public health to identify what the problems are, but then to use a uh, delivery system model uh, to really try and implement that and how can we work together. That to me seems to be a really interesting uh, uh, research agenda and I'd be interested in your comments on that. Thank you, Mark, as usual. Um, <clears throat> somebody said that the definition of madness is to try the same thing over and over, expect a different result. So <clears throat> I've been trying it for 20 years in the public health world, but uh, there is some, some movement. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, there is the public health agencies and you know, states, federal, it's uh, local, but there is the public's health, which is population health. And I think where we are right now is that <clears throat> the need for a partnership between all of these groups together, because the delivery of genomics is going to be in the healthcare system. Uh, what we can do from a public health agencies and states is sort of uh, build on a number of activities like what Michigan and a few other states are doing. One is educating the public, educating the providers, working with the healthcare systems, developing <clears throat> indicators for population health improvements at the state level, like how do we know uh, that we're doing well. Um, surveillance systems, uh, taking care of disparities, taking care of the policy issues that allow um, uh, sort of uh, access to data, access to test results, um, you know, um, lab quality. Uh, you know, some states are better than others, like New York and California, in ensuring uh, the lab quality. So there is a role for public health, the small p, the, the public health agencies. But at the end of the day, uh, healthcare, public health have to partner together in this implementation space especially if we have to take care of health disparities. Because at the end, uh, the beginning of implementation will occur with early adopters, uh, with academic institutions. Uh, there will be big holes even in implementing tier one applications. I mean, the data are clear. Uh, as, as was said earlier, uh, black women uh, have, are less likely to get counseling, less likely to get uh, BRCA testing, less likely to act on the result of the testing, less likely to have access 
to services. So there is a role for uh, the both public health and the public's health and all of this. And I would encourage you know, the IGNITE network and of course NHGRI to kind of d develop a schema for implementation that allows for that interaction to occur. Now in extreme situations like newborn screening, uh, where you have a clear public health role because the healthcare system was not doing its job, i.e. PKU kids were missed at birth, and you needed a, a rapid ascertainment schema, that's how it evolved. And you know, my friend Jim, Jim Evans keeps saying, we screen newborns, don't we? So could there be an adult genetic screening program that could be population-wide, that includes maybe a subset of the 56 genes for which um, uh, all, everybody gets uh, access to the results of that, maybe not in an opportunistic setting, but more, more of a testing scenario. That's something for the future. It's something that uh, this network can explore. Thank you. Howard. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the comments that Levi and others made of, about uh, getting, uh, getting people to do what we know we should be doing now. Uh, I think there's a great opportunity there, both in terms of the testing and also the access to some of these, these therapies. Uh, the, the question I have for the panel is, I is, uh, love their thoughts, in particular Rick's, around do we need to go back to the, the model or could we reconsider the model around specific cohorts of patients in our trials? In our NCI cooperative group trials, uh, we get very excited if we would get 25 percent, uh, actually we get excited if we get 25 percent non-white. Um, patients on our trial, of which there's a whole bunch of different people in that category, um, because the NCI looks at the national averages, and if we beat the average, uh, we get a gold star. And uh, the, the idea, though, that we now have a data set where we don't have definitive numbers to actually draw a conclusion about these populations for, for outcomes, for toxicity frequencies, certainly for molecular aspects. And so, you know, Rick's been involved in some studies that were plus and minus in terms of, of cohorts, and I'm sure I'm ripping a scab off for you, um, but the, the, uh, the idea that we have definitive data to actually advise a group um, is, is what's missing right now, and so I'd love Petal's thoughts. Well, actually, I, I, uh, <clears throat> I think, you know, there's room for, for multiple sort of strategies. Uh, I think, you know, we, we, we should go back to at least having some kind of uh, cutoff, some threshold, some quota, right? But at the same time, I really like what uh, uh, the example with the, the, the APO1 example where, you know, the, there's, here's something that you go to the community, specific community, with this particular test that actually could be impactful, right? So irrespective of numbers, just say, you know, this is something that is uh, potentially actionable in, for this uh, population. So I, I, I would try all types of strategies, to be honest with you. I, I wouldn't necessarily say one's better than the other or... Or, or, or what, but um, uh, we have to do something, I know that. You know, the, the, the sad part is that, you know, the train has left, right? The train has left the station. And if we don't do something now to sort of uh, increase those numbers, increase that knowledge base for the diverse populations, it, it's, you know, it, you're not gonna be able to catch it. Um, I, can I just say one thing? Um, I'm obviously passionate about engaging um, diverse people in research. Um, one of the things that Ignite gave us the opportunity for, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not supposed to say this, Ebony, is that um, we, we are not going to finish our recruitment on time, and it's not because my projections are wrong, it's because the group I was working with when we wrote the grant was like, yes, we can enroll you know, 200 people every month starting month three. And, and I said, well, actually, we can't because we're going to have to take six or eight months to figure out who our population is, do some formative research, understand why people with diverse backgrounds would want to be tested, how they want the results returned, both the clinicians and the patients. So we're kind of right on time from where we thought we were going to be, but a little behind in this. And so, you know, this idea of it might take a little more time, and sometimes it might take a little more money to do some of these things. And I worry because I know that when most of, most of us get grant funding, what you want to do is you want to recruit on time, on budget, 
And, and some of the stuff like that I saw with the PMI, I was worried was gonna be unrealistic. If you wanna recruit tons of patients really quickly, what are you gonna do? You're gonna to go to the friendliest clinicians, the easiest to recruit patients, and, and the rest of the diverse population is gonna fall by the wayside. So I think that really needs to be part of how we're doing things or we're, I don't think we're ever gonna see enough diversity. Thank you, um, yes ma'am. Um, so I had a question and comment primarily for um, Muin. So um, my, I, I'll do the comment first, I guess. Um, so uh, in my presentation on clinical uh, um, outcomes, I think you're gonna hear that we're really thinking along the same context that you're suggesting, which is as we implement, we need to garner data. We need to figure out how can we develop data that support long-term use of, of the implementation as we also show the implementation. So, um, so, so we're definitely, as a network, thinking along those lines. Um, my question was on your statement in Michigan about African-American women uh, underutilizing the genetic testing, I think, for BRCA. Is that, is that sort of the normal access cost kind of barrier, or is that provided free so there's some other sort of barriers there? Um, not so sure. I have to uh, <clears throat> consult Deb Duquette, who is the uh, architect of those findings in Michigan, and um, I think it's a little bit of both. There may be some sensitivities around testing, but I don't want to give you the wrong answer. So uh, stay tuned. I think, um, Eric, did you have your hand raised? Sure. A comment first to Mark is I, I think it's not appropriate to define public health as what county public health departments do. That's a very small part of public health. This meeting is public health. I think we need to look at modern public health much, much broader and not define it by traditional agencies. But my, my question to the panel is about diversity. I, I think it's a little dangerous and I, I think we pat ourselves a little too much on the back to define diversity only by skin color, sometime by language. One of the things I'm afraid of as a citizen is the growing economic diversity in this country. And I'm a little bit worried by focusing by, on a narrow definition of diversity, we're going to leave out um, the lower incomes as, as technology, as precision health grows. And, and what can we do as a group to make sure that these initiatives are not the initiatives for the wealthy? I think that's an excellent point. I, 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 and I would hope that the entire panel sort of agrees with, with, with your statement. Um, but you know, when you think about the gaps though, right, there, there are gaps that are um, biological. And so you know, being poor doesn't mean you have a particular set of genes, right? So, so you, 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 what you would pick up in that sort of uh, um, population would be more of the social, uh, cultural, behavioral sort of uh, influences on, on, on health, which is, are utterly important. But there's also gaps biologically that really, I think, are, are astounding in a sense, if, if you really think about the, the amount of money that we're putting into this implementation. But I, I, and I agree with that, but your point is very well taken. And in many of the suggestions uh, and the approaches that have been discussed, actually, if they were applied, um, would would encompass exactly what you're saying. I mean, it, the 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 issue of, of so there's obviously there's the issue of, of knowledge of what the information means and what have you, and that and that actually uh, it, so if one says okay, this is what these variants are, this is what they mean, and obviously to the extent that they're relevant to diverse populations, that's part of the education. Uh, if if that's being matched with additional uh, implementations that overcome. Uh, barriers to access in, in low populations. I think one, you're right, one can in principle put together a set of policies that in essence will address uh, a lot of what you're saying. So the low, the, the economically underserved, if, if that's the target, you're gonna get a lot of the, uh, the uh, African American, Hispanic, uh, and other underserved groups. And so the, 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 obviously there are specific considerations about variance in, in different backgrounds that ought to be part of that. But the big picture, you're right. There, the, we ought to be able to have an umbrella that covers all kinds of diversity. And, and it's, I haven't heard anything that would preclude that from this conversation. 
Now, one of the things I was thinking about earlier is how much of our premise here is on showing up for preventative health care. And if you're in a low-income population and you're getting most of your health care kind of in acute settings, who's going to be the person that raises these issues and translates it? And then if you end up in a population where you get a variant of uncertain significance because we don't have enough data about your ancestry, who's going to follow up down the line and bring these things up too? So I think those are big picture things that are really enormous healthcare systems. Uh, Katrina? <laughs> One of those. <laughs> so I practice in the Pacific Northwest and it makes me uncomfortable to get through a whole diversity session and not hear the word Asian, because those are my patients, and they are very underrepresented in genetic research, and you get no brownie points with NIH for collecting Asian people. There's not a, you know, not a box for that that you're checking to meet a certain target and goal. And I'm just wondering, it's, it's a pretty big population in the U.S. in general, but in the Pacific Coast, it's a very large population. And we have the same problems in that population of not understanding what these variants do and not understanding what the best care is for these patients. How do we get mm -hmm. their voices at the table too? Um, because it's not, you know, it's not in the definition of underrepresented uh, by NIH. Did you have, yes, I'm sorry, I can't see your name tag. Okay. <laughs> I got glasses on, I can't see. Um, and far in terms of reaching to, I would say, many diversities, have you guys thought about, first of all, looking at places, and I can only go off anecdote, I have family members in Arkansas, right? And the low income, but a lot of, a lot of their health issues is stuff that they don't know. Like maybe the doctors they go to, aren't explaining things to them, they're not explaining, you know, you know, preventive me measures or anything like that properly to where they understand that. The other issue might be, you know, look at your public schools. I mean, some of those kids could probably communicate or help communicate um, this issue to the populations that you're trying to reach. And then for every poor person, there's also that family member that is, you know, middle class, wealthy, I mean, it's, it's all getting that information from different angles to the right people. You can't just look at urban. I mean, go across rural America. That's just my two cents. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, this has been an extremely helpful and very interesting discussion. I have a few uh, questions, so I'll, I'll address it, but then you, the individuals on the panel uh, to Dr. Curry, I, I wonder if there's, um, are there materials that you have or CDC or other groups have to both train populations, uh, consumers, as well as providers uh, for this collaborative that you are thinking about? And um, <clears throat> there are existing tools on our website and the Cancer Division website. Uh, the no BRCA tools for providers and uh, the public are one. We have an implementation toolkit for health departments for a few tier one applications. Um, they are not very well used because of the lack of funding. Uh, there are uh, tools that are being developed as we speak as part of this action collaborative. So within the next year or two, there, there could be many more. Yeah, and we'd love to partner with you on some of that. The other question I had was for you. Um, one of the big rate limiting steps for us as we're scaling this up is genetic counselors. We cannot, especially the kind of genetic counselors we now have, are primarily trained to counsel parents about monogenetic or rare diseases and not really for the kinds of things that we're talking about here. Um, and, and while we're trying to scale up our program, the curriculum has to be changed, and that's, that's a big challenge that, that we need help from a group like this because of the types of counseling that you'll be doing. Um, I wonder if you have any 
current plans or this group has any plans to do that? At this point? Sure, so this is something that the genetic counseling profession is well aware of and they've actively engaged in a workforce assessment which I have heard some preliminary data on and not surprisingly there's a huge gap between them. I think there are probably three positions for every genetic counseling graduate. Yes. As, at this point, um, as a training program director, I can tell you that all of us are actively engaged in trying to train our students to deal with the complexities of the adult genetics conditions and how we do it. And, and our students are not just taking positions in pediatric genetics anymore. That's actually the minority. Yeah. So it does take time. Um, I think we're gonna have to all work hard to find ways to bridge that gap and continue the expansion and kind of not get steamrolled and make sure we're doing it appropriately, but we are well aware of the problem. Um, I, I think that part of it is defining when and why we need genetic counselors for everything. So in our model for APOL1, which is, you know, it's a risk for kidney failure, like high blood pressure is a risk for kidney failure and other things are risk for kidney failure, or with pharmacogenomics, where it's like your creatinine's too high, don't take this, you have this genetic variant, don't take this. The way that our model is, is we have our genetic counselors be the super counselors. Right. They're the ones teaching other people how not to screw it up. You know, in, in the old days with HIV, it used to be that I, as a primary care doc, was not allowed to test my patient for HIV without a counselor first counseling them, and the counselor had to return results. And then we realized, well, we can't do that anymore. There's, there's too much going on. So I think it's going to take a definition of the counselors elevating to a higher level and saying, what can we have other people do and what do we have to do? Mm -hmm. We have the kind of the equivalent of a community health worker returning results yes. and of the 1,800 people we've tested so far and we've offered all of them a free meeting with a genetic counselor, none have availed themselves of it. Yeah, and I actually think that's really appropriate. Yeah. Um, I think that of all of the conditions we've talked about when we've interviewed non-genetics healthcare providers as part of our ClinGen study, pharmacogenomics, for example, is one of the things where people really agree we don't need a genetic counselor. But the hard part is that even when you get genetic counselors and geneticists sold on the idea that we can sort of teach people how to do this, the other providers are very frequently pushing back and don't feel ready. And I think that's gonna be a big challenge too. Yeah, maybe a better uh, definition is genetic educators rather than counselors. Uh, finally, in terms of diversity, one of the big problems is the rural community, which is, while it's you know complex, it's very um, different kind of challenge. Uh, it's not not so much uh, language as opposed to access. But the other problems, particularly for states like Indiana, which are very high farming states. Um, approximately 10%, maybe even 15% of the Indiana population is totally migrant population. We have uh, farm workers who come probably from July through October, and they're all from Mexico, and they just stay for four months, and then they go back. So we have this incredibly uh, sort of transient population that is Spanish-speaking that's not a simple challenge to address. So um, there are some complexities, Stephen, to minorities that we have. So we'll, we'll take our last question and that from um, Nita. Thank, thank you. you. Um, clinicians, so this is a question for the group to think about. Uh, practice group health systems, they usually follow national guidelines and at least in pharmacogenomics, I want us to think about how this group can actually be integrated into chess guidelines, working groups that provide a balanced view of the evidence um, in these national guidelines, because this is what most hospitals follow. Um, the, the second um, thing I want us to think about is uh, health disparities, picking up on the thread of not just racial diversity, but socioeconomic diversity. And, you know, perhaps the thing we can think about is if you're studying Parkinson's, it's okay to have just 1% African Americans, but if you're studying heart failure and that patient group is 40% African American, then you should really be, you know, the threshold um, should, the bar should be set, you should be recruiting 40%. Um, and the last thing is, you know, I, I presented at a health disparities conference recently, and I got the whole 
a sense that all the genomic findings in press have the, 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 the way it's presented in the lay literature has a lot of negative connotations. So we as a group need to do better in terms of communicating, for example, the APOL1 story is this is impactful to you and to take what Carol said is be at the table so you're not on the menu. Um, so those are the. Thank you. Did you those are great comments. One, one brief comment that your second point uh, seemed to, that it might have been a bit of a conflation of, so if you're doing clinical research, you're doing a clinical trial on a disease, that, obviously if it's a disease that uh, predominantly affects um, diverse populations, ethnically diverse populations, that obviously it's important to understand how those are being represented and hopefully be proportional there. And there's a whole series of barriers that that may entail uh, to doing that research. But there's also the issue, which I think a lot of this is about, of where there's already a certain level of clinical utility data out there. And then it's about how do you implement that uh, particularly genomic-based evidence in broad populations. And those have a different set of challenges, potentially, than the clinical research. So there's, there's, there's some overlap, but they may, there may be a different set of challenges. There. Right. But how do you discover what things are important in these um, health disparities population if you don't engage them in those clinical research? Thank you. So I'd like to um, thank all of you for a very robust um, discussion. And I'd just like to bring the session to a close by summarizing what I heard as the key points. Um, first is that diversity is important, not just from the perspective of race and ethnicity, but also from the perspective of biological factors and economic characteristics and geography. And so as we move forward with thinking about uh, diversity and ways to um, uh, not have genomics and precision medicine enhance disparities. It's really critical that we think about diversity from a, um, a much broader perspective. The second thing related to that is um, it's critical for us to um, develop and implement strategies for having greater inclusion of diverse populations in our cohorts and in our research programs. Um, I think I would just want to draw your attention to um, the work that's being done at um, Carroll Center, and I don't remember the catchy acronym for it. Guard. Guard thank you. Um, because I think it really does really exemplify, in my opinion, uh, some of the things that and approaches that need to be replicated um, to ensure that we include diverse providers, include diverse and diverse patients um, in our in our research. Related to that, I think um, it's really important, and this was something that I think came out in the panel discussion and the presentation about um, ways that it's important for us to leverage existing resources to understand better um, uh, variants in diverse populations and whether or not those are actually um, variants of uncertain significance. So we need to focus our effort and energy there. And then the final point, well, maybe the next to the final point is the the model and the methods that are used for delivering genomic services. Um, many years ago when I first started doing work in BRCA1 and BRCA2, it was sort of the model of meeting with a genetic counselor for an hour and a half to two hours. Um, and now as we're learning more about um, genetic factors and variants, that, um, that model may not be appropriate for most clinical settings where we want to see more things integrated into primary care. So thinking about um, new models for delivering genomic services and how to leverage our existing resources, um, both from genetic counselors to community health workers to other types of providers is really important. Um, and just a closing comment and perhaps more of a reflection, you know, many of the issues related to diversity are things that and points that have been raised over a number of years. And I just wonder, um, and one example is, you know, and Muin's talk about African American women being less likely to utilize um, genetic testing for BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. Um, and it strikes me that that has been sort of a, um, a consistent theme over a period of time. And I just wonder about the need and the value of instituting a I mean, Carol had a really nice term for it, a translational genomics working group at the level of NIH that really thought about developing tools and resources and disseminating 
and de developing and disseminating best practices for how to um, address diversity issue and disparities issues across the portfolio of, of genomics research that's being done at NHGRI. So I'll leave that as a final thought and turn it back over to Ebony. Thank you, Shanita. Um, just, we're going to have the break. We're going to come meet back promptly at 11.15 to start the next session. So if the moderators, speakers, and discussants can be at the front of the room at 11.15. Um, and also, we are going to have a group photo. If everyone could make their way to the front of the cafeteria, that is where the group photo will be. And hopefully, if we get there quickly, we'll have plenty of time to use the restroom or anything else um, by 11.15. Thank you. Thank you.